Today we're in Borough Park, Brooklyn to visit the most precious blood monastery. Welcome to a very special episode of City of Churches. Today, today we're in Borough Park, Brooklyn to visit the most precious blood monastery. Now this church and monastery was built over a hundred years ago. It has a lot of wonderful images and a lot of unique history. We'll also find out about two different communities of nuns who live a cloistered life here. At a time, the monastery was full and there was 60 sisters here present and a great number of people coming from lay people for the services for the, to receive the sacraments. But with time and the change of the community outside, it used to be more Italian and Irish and very Catholic roots. Now it's largely Chinese, um, there's a large Jewish population. So that numbers were dwindling. They invited us to come and by God's providence, we have many things similar with our charism and their charism. You know, when I first walked in here, one of the first things that captured me was the Stations of the Cross. You know, there's a lot of things to learn about this monastery. My name is Sister Crucci. I'm originally from Buffalo, New York. My name is Sister Mary of the Annunciation. I was born in Kansas. Um, my name is Sister Fleur de Carmo, and I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. My name is Sister Mary, Mother of Hope, and I was born in Mexico City, but I grew up in Pennsylvania. My name is Maria del Verbo Encarnado. It's in Spanish because I am from Argentina. Uh, it means Mary of the Incarnate Word. My name is Sister Mary Eileen. I'm a member of the Sisters of Doris of the Precious Blood. And we're here at the Monastery of the Precious Blood right now. And I will explain a little bit about the decor, the, uh, the altar, and some of the paintings. If you look above the altar, this tableau was devised by Monsignor Stedman, our, the, the chaplain at the time. And uh, he hired a an artist from Germany to do all the paintings in this chapel. And <clears throat> the, the tableau above the altar, it, it, it represents the crucifixion. And this, the face of the Blessed Virgin is the face of the painter's wife, which I always found very beautiful. And the, the angels below the arms of the cross are supposed to be the Sisters of the Precious Blood. It's supposed to be us gathering the drops of blood as it fell from the, the, the cross. And you see, see the whole tableau, the centurion that pierced the side of Christ, the Blessed Virgin, the women at the foot of the cross. This is what first grabs your attention when you walk into the church, the scene of Calvary. Um, and it's complete with Mary, the mother of Jesus, beneath the cross, of course with John and Mary Magdalene. Um, and also the, the holy women that St. Luke speaks about in the Gospel, all standing there at the foot of the cross, and Jesus, of course, crucified. Surrounding this main painting are seven smaller paintings, um, circular paintings that depict the seven moments where Jesus' blood was shed. So beginning with um, his circumcision in the presentation in the temple, where even just a drop of his blood was shed, which we know by faith that just one drop of the precious blood of Christ was enough for the redemption of all mankind. Um, but then we go through and we see the rest, the other six paintings, and we see the extravagance of God's love for us and all of the blood that was shed um, through all of the scenes and the moments of the passion, like the, uh, Jesus' agony in the garden, the scourging at the pillar, um, the crowning with thorns, and then all the way up until his heart was pierced and his blood
poured forth there. Behind these smaller images, we see um, a plant with a flower flowing through. It's good that I'm talking about flowers, that's my name. Um, <laughs> and this is traditionally known as the passion flower. So it's the, um, the plant whose wood was used um, to make, to form and fashion the wood of Jesus' cross. So these are the flowers, the fruits of this wood. Um, and we see the precious blood as also the fruit of the cross. And now we come down to the altar. Uh, Monsignor Stedman also devised this, the, he designed the altar. And he didn't want a big elaborate altar because he felt that people's eyes would go up and down the pillars, you know. And so he, he has the um, tabernacle, which houses the body and blood of Christ as a tent, it's like a little tent, and then you see the, the crown above, that, the gold crown above, signifying that Christ is, is the king. Uh, years ago, before Vatican II, when masses were offered only once a day, Monsignor Stedman had these, these two circles below the altar, showing where the Mass was being offered at any time during the day. You see a.m. and p.m. because it was always offered in the morning. So that was so anybody that came in here would know where Mass was being offered in Ireland, Iceland, any, every place in the world. Then down here on the steps, uh, these are inv invocations that we say every day in our way of life. Eternal Father, through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, I wish to unite myself with Jesus, now offering his precious blood in the holy sacrifice of the Mass in, and you name the country. For the needs of Holy Church, the conversion of sinners, and the relief of the souls in purgatory. Now that's pretty much about the altar. Up above we have an image of God the Father with the Holy Spirit and it's right above the altar. So it's an image of the Father accepting the sacrifice of his son in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And it's done through the Holy Spirit. So that's why we have um, the presence of the Holy Spirit also in the bosom of the Father. My favorite thing, every time everyone comes, I always love to point it out. The two murals, the first one is everyone carrying their cross, and then the second one on the other side is everyone reflected, the exact same people carrying the palm of peace, you know, or entering into the kingdom of heaven. And the words around the chapel say, if, if you decide to be my disciple and take up your cross daily and follow me, you will have eternal life. And so it's, it's both roads of carrying the cross, but also reaching and knowing that through the cross is the grace of the resurrection. Father Stedman had wrote in a book in 1932 when he kind of gave um, a repertoire of what is in the, of his, in the chapel. He called it the living procession of the cross. And so the artist, his name is um, Rudolf Schmausel. He was a German artist. He did a very uh, distinct depiction and the New York Herald Times in, in the papers, they stated that he had a technique to, to combine um, medieval art with modernism in the sense that you can see um, like modern elements of today mixed with the reality of, of religious art that you would say happened 1900 years ago at that time um, because he depicted people today and also parts of the buildings like the Empire State Building I believe is in the background um, the McDonald Memorial High School of Bishop McDonnell Memorial High School in Brooklyn is also painted in the background. Factories, different things to bring to life today that the sacrifice of the cross is a living procession until the end of time, till the consummation of time. And so it invites one um, right away to understand that I'm also a part of that procession. It depicts the Holy Father, cardinals, priests, he paints three religious, Mother Aurelia, who's the founder of the Sisters of the Door of the Precious Blood, um, a Carmelite sister, and St. Catherine. But then he also depicts uh, an elderly couple, you know, like um, reaching the end, 
struggling through, having the burden of bearing a family. That he paints a young man who has fallen. And at the very end, you see a mother with her baby and her child in her hand, a little girl following behind. But that each one in their pathway of, cross, of their life has their own cross. And it, it um, is constantly involving you to follow Christ, who's at the front, showing the way. That there's no, there's no distinction or deception of that way of Christ. That it is to follow your cross. And that it's pointed out to us, it's very clear. It's hard because you see them struggle the whole way through. But what's beautiful is on the other side of the chapel is you see them with joy carrying their palm as Christ receives them into heaven. And you see the little children going first as let the children come to me. <laughs> They'll be the first received into the kingdom of heaven. And you see the Holy Father at the end making sure that his, his whole flock um, has reached uh, eternal life. It's very interesting. The painter, um, Rudolf Schmansel, he passed away while he was finishing the chapel. And the image right behind you is the image of the Pietà. He had painted halfway through, and he just came another normal day at the monastery to, to work on that painting. It was the last one, um, and he had passed away. And they said, he died a holy death, and they say, with, a, with his face turned toward Christ. Because he was, at that moment, painting the face of Christ, had, having passed away in his mother's arm. Um, and his son, actually, came and finished the painting. And it's beautiful. <laughs> Art is supposed to be a means of coming to know God, the beauty of God. And so, in that sense, it's uh, important for us because it's a means to get to know God. Because through the visible things here on earth, we come to know the invisible realities. And so that's why it's so important for us to know um, yeah, the art that we have around us and to what it points to. Because we have, for example, behind us a pelican with its young and its nourishing off the blood. And so that's a reality we see in nature, but it points to the eternal reality, which is Christ who offered himself, gave us his own blood so that we might have life. And so in that sense, it's important to us. And for me in particular, because I am a cloistered sister and in a particular way, we're asked to give our life completely to God for the good of others. It speaks to me very loudly. <laughs> we'll be right back with more City of Churches. Welcome back to City of Churches with our visit at the Most Precious Blood Monastery. Now, there are two different orders of nuns who live a cloistered life here. So let's find out a little about them. Well, um, the Sister Adorers were founded first in Canada. Um, by Mother Catherine Aurelie Cahuet in 1861. And then, um, to give you kind of the time frame, this the foundation of this monastery was in 1880, so it was only 20 years later, um, and still in the lifetime of Mother Catherine, so it's pretty recent. And she had a great desire to make a foundation in the United States, um, but there were many, many obstacles and trials and hoops that the sisters had to jump through before actually coming here to Fort Hamilton Parkway. But one um, grace, one huge grace, was um, the bishop of Brooklyn at the time was Bishop Laughlin. And he actually had two of his family members enter with the Sisters of the Precious Blood in Canada, um, which made him a little bit more favorable to bringing the sisters here to New York. Um, the sisters kept having to build new monasteries because they would outgrow them. The first monastery of the Precious Blood in Brooklyn was on Sumter Street, so it wasn't here. Finally, um, they came here to Fort Hamilton Parkway in 1910 was when this monastery was built. And um, even after that, they had to add another wing. So, so at one point they had more than 60 sisters living here in the monastery. We have the unique situation of having two congregations present here. It's historically the Sisters of the Precious Blood, and the monastery still belongs to them, of course. Um, they invited us five years ago to come and to join them here, as they're a little elderly and dwindling. By God's providence, we have many things similar with our charism and their charism, and having, of course, a great love for the Eucharist. Eucharistic adoration is one of the, the central points that we can unite our charisms. So they have great devotion, of course, to the precious blood of our Lord, 
Our Institute's charism is founded with the Incarnation, which is again having a great love for the humanity that our Lord assumed, and His precious blood, His sacred heart are, of course, the common factor for us. It's a, a mutual help. They have sheltered us and given us a place to be able to pray and to offer our lives in sacrifice to God. And it's also beautiful to see their example. So it's not only the material aspect that, yes, we have a roof over our heads and uh, we have a place to pray, but also the, the example of their fidelity, like Sister Precious now, I think, turns 94. And so her years of fidelity throughout a whole lifetime really are a testimony to us who are young and just getting started on the way. And God might want us to be here for a while, so <laughs> it's a beautiful example. Presently, there's three sisters of the precious blood here. And within our order of the servants of the Lord, we have 10 in our community. We share the most important part of the day together. We share in the holy sacrifice of the mass in the morning together. Um, and also in the morning, we share and we, we unite our voices in prayer to God in morning prayer in one hour of the divine office. Um, and that is the the strongest moment of community life for, for any community. Other than that, um, the sisters live their charism and we, um, in our community, we live our charism in sort of two separate communities living under one roof, um, helping one another by our prayers and our sacrifices. I could give you our daily schedule. <laughs> it's a rhythm quite hourly. But our main structure is composed, first of all, on the hour of our Holy Mass. And from there, we extend the sacrifice and our prayer, which is in its highest form in the Mass, to the two hours of adoration that we have daily, one in the morning and one in the evening. And that method of vocal prayer is also uh, penetrated throughout the day in the seven hours that we pray of the Liturgy of the Hours that we chant. So comprised of that, we're in and out of the chap chapel <laughs> many times. But we do, we do daily duties. Um, kitchen, laundry, cleaning. Um, apart from that, we take care of the sacristy. A lot of sisters do manual work in the sewing room, preparing altar linens or chasubles for priests, as other little works that we do. But our, our main work, our main apostolate, is the work of God. God has a vocation for, for each person, and it's a very particular vocation. And I knew growing up that my vocation was to be a contemplative sister. And so finally realizing that brings great peace and great joy because you're able to fulfill the will of God for you, and that's where you find your true peace and your true joy, is doing what He desires of you. Cloister life is a, a special call inside the, the call. No? It's signed by three essential elements. No? Um, silence, solitude, and enclosure, no? the grails. No? It's a, a physical separation, material separation from the world. It means that we belong to God. So uh, this is our apostolate, no? to pray. And uh, the more we are united to God, the more effective will be our prayers. So the Pray For Me initiative of the diocese. The bishop, through Monsignor Harrington, um, approached us with this idea to bring about more confidence in the prayers of others. And um, so it's an initiative, um, a website, or a part of the website of the diocese, where people can um, put in their prayer request, and um, there is a man from the diocese who sends these prayer requests to us here in the monastery. And we have one sister each day who checks these prayer requests that come in, and um, she informs the rest of the community about them, and we pray specifically for these intentions as we pray evening prayer each day um, as a way of uniting ourselves to the prayers of all of the faithful in the diocese. Um, and also as a way for us, um, for all of the faithful to partake in our apostolate of prayer um, and to grow in confidence in, in the prayer that we make to our Father. Um, so the website is www.dioceseofbrooklyn.org slash pray for me. For us, what's most important is that we always keep focus on the one thing necessary, and that for everyone is God. We have the, the gift or the grace to meet the Pope, thanks to um, 
the Divine Providence, and also to our Bishop Di Marcio, who invited us to, to meet the Pope because uh, four of us uh, were from Argentina. So he wanted that we meet him uh, in the airport. Well, it was uh, something we never expected. I mean, as a contemplative living in a cloister, uh, we never thought even about this. We wanted, of course, but we never thought we, have, uh, we would have the opportunity to meet him. So we went and we gave to him a few presents. He said a few words, uh, just pray for me, pray for me, and pray for me, <laughs> and thanks. <laughs> so we had the opportunity also to kiss uh, his hands. And well, it was really a grace, something a special day we, we will never forget. When we come back, we're gonna see something very unique here at the Most Precious Blood Monastery. The stained glass windows here contain incredible images and prayers. Let's find out about them. This whole chapel was designed as a way to bring those who come here to contemplate and to love our Savior's precious blood. And this stained glass window that we have in the sanctuary is the largest of the windows and of course keeps that same intention to draw all who see it to have a greater love and honor for the blood of our Savior. And it was one of the last gifts that Monsignor Stedman had made to the monastery. He was the director of the confraternity and also the chaplain of the monastery for many years until he died in 1946. And just a few weeks before his death is when he had finished the stained glass window and unveiled it for the sisters. And if we look at the whole image, there's many, many symbols um, to see and we'll explain with Monsignor's words how those relate to the precious blood and why he chose to put them in the stained glass window. The overall theme of the window is seen by the words of scripture which run through it. It says, Thou hast redeemed us, O Lord, in thy blood, which is a sight from the book of Revelation, chapter 5. And within the stained glass window, the central image is broken into three parts. In the top, we see the church triumphant, Christ our Savior pictured with his sacred heart in the central. To his right, we see his blessed mother who is there interceding for us. And we can see her right hand is pointing towards the earth as she intercedes for all of us below. And on the other side of our Lord is St. Peter, also in heaven, holding in his hands the scriptures. Also in that, that top of the central image, we see the Trinity reflected. As on one side of Christ, we have the symbol for God the Father, which is the all-knowing eye, an eye. And on the other side is a symbol we're more familiar with, which is the dove of the Holy Spirit. Below the image of the church triumphant, we see then two images um, full of people where Monsignor had a desire to reflect the universality of Christ's salvation. That really his blood was shed for each one of us from all nations and all times. And so there in both the central um, image and the one below it, we see men and women from all nations, all ethnicities, all classes of life, from priests to, re to religious, to um, there's Hindus, there's uh, Induits, there's Mexican families, European, of all ethnicities, to really show the universality of Christ's saving blood. And, and so we see very dominant, we saw the church triumphant with Christ in heaven and the saints, and then the church militant, as they call us who are still here on earth. And so immediately when you look at the stained glass window, you may think, well, they left out the church suffering, the church in purgatory. But upon a close look in that central image, we'll see against the blue background, diamond-shaped figures, which when you first see the window, you think it's just decoration. But upon a close look, you see that those images contain souls within them. And at the bottom of the blue, you see the fires of purgatory. And something that's distinct about those diamond-shaped figures, as they approach the, uh, the beatific vision, which is Christ in heaven, they are become purified, more gold in color. So the artist wanted to, to really show the purification of the souls in purgatory as they draw close to heaven. So below those images, of, but still within the central image, um, we see the four ends of the Mass, which is adoration, thanksgiving, atonement, and intercession, imploring. So those words are written there with respective symbols for them also. Below these four images in the bottom, we see very clearly images of the Sisters of the Precious Blood and their traditional habits of the red and black. And they're gathered around a chalice 
And above that chalice, we see the sacred heart again, as it's being pierced with a spear, and that blood is overflowing the chalice. And if you look very closely, you'll see that that blood which overflows the chalice forms one river underneath all of the sisters that continues all around the borders of the entire stained glass window. And within that river of blood that flows around the whole image, we see the seven sacraments in a number of different images um, to show again, as we said, how the blood of Christ is made present through the sacraments for us and his salvation reaches us through these means. So starting on the bottom left side, we see symbols for baptism, first by a closed tomb, and then an anchor, which is a symbol of hope, with a shell of baptism. It's one of the traditional symbols for baptism. And above that, a second tomb, but this time it's an open tomb with a lily coming from it, showing that new life that comes from baptism. Above this image, we see confirmation, which is the symbol of the Holy Spirit, the dove there, with seven flames of fire around him. Above, we see the sacrament of confession. If you look closely, you see a confessional screen, but in front of that are tears of contrition. And behind that screen, you see the keys of absolution. Around the top of the stained glass window then, the next sacrament that is seen is the Holy Eucharist. And on both sides of those images, we see um, like interlaced hearts. And it's, it strikes the eye first because they're not symmetrical. One side has two and the other side has three. The two hearts that are there represent the divinity and the humanity of Christ. But on the other side, he wanted to put three hearts there to show the social union that exists in the church, that social aspect of communion. We see the next sacrament coming down the left-hand side is holy orders. And there it's pictured by a chalice with a priestly stole draped over it. And also it has the books that are proper to the priesthood. After that, we see symbols of holy matrimony where it has two lamps that are lit with marriage rings around them, forming like a halo around the lamp, the two wedding rings. And then below that, the last image that we have is for the sacrament of anointing, for the anointing of the sick. And there we have a lamp at the bottom, and above that, another anchor, which we said was a symbol of hope. So this is the last sacrament that one would receive before entering eternal life. So it's that symbol of hope that with the sacraments, through the blood of Christ, heaven is theirs. And that lamp, that final lamp there, makes reference um, to St. Matthew's Gospel where it says the virgins were ready with their lamps lit for the bridegroom's coming. The windows were designed by Adelbert Mayer, who was a German artist, selected by Monsignor. All the artists, the artists' work here in the chapel, as was his intention, was to foster a greater love and devotion. As you know, at the end of every episode, we always show something very unique on our episode. Our chapel was very blessed to be to be given and holds three very important relics. In 1932, during the papacy of Pius XI, we received the first one of the relic from the staff of St. Joseph. Um, it was given to us with the papers of Cardinal Joseph Adesio. And the other one in 1933, we received part of the veil of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Both of the relics are held within a reliquary um, enclosed with a little grill underneath the main statues of the altar. The third one is the relic of the true cross. It's a piece of the true cross that was brought to Rome um, in the third century by Saint Elena, the mother of Constantine the Great. Uh, and we received a piece of that in 1958 from Pope Pius XII, the last year of his pontificate. Well, that's it for this episode of City of Churches, and I want to thank you so much for tuning in and watching it. If you have any questions about this particular episode, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter or our own website, netnewyork.tv. Or you can write into us at City of Churches at 1712 10th Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11215. Until next time, I'm Anthony Mangano. Thank you so much for watching, and God bless you.